Okay, so it's live. Good evening, everyone. I am Tisha Majumdar, and I welcome you all to this panel discussion on forced migration, curated under TMY's review, March 2022, in association with Global South Colloquium, University of Victoria. TMY's review, March 2022, under the current theme of migration, displacement, and resettlement, seeks to explore and understand the niceties of migration from the perspectives of forced migration. We are calling for submissions of stories, poems, and essays, and for project architecture and submission guidelines, please visit www.tellmeastory.biz. Today's topic of discussion is Violence and Exodus, Representation of Migration in Literature and Cinema. We are honored to have with us Professor Ira Bhaskar, Professor Pranjan Vora, and Mr. Siddharth Gigo as our esteemed speakers. Thank you so much for joining. I shall now quickly introduce our speakers. <clears throat> professor Ira Bhaskar is Professor of Cinema Studies at the School of Arts and Aesthetics, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. She has co-authored Islamicate Cultures of Bombay Cinema, co-edited Bombay Cinema's Islamicate Histories, and edited, annotated, and introduced the first volume of Ghatak's Partition Quartet on Nagarik. She has published essays on melodrama and Indian cinema, the Indian New Wave, historical poetics, Bombay cinema, and the partition and contemporary communalism. Her current research is on historical trauma, violence, memory, and representation. Our second speaker is Mr. Siddharth Gigo. Mr. Siddharth Gigo is a Commonwealth Prize winning author. In 2015, he won the Commonwealth Short Story Prize Asia for his short story, The Umbrella Man. He has written two books of poetry, four novels, The Garden of Solitude, Meher, A Love Story, The Lion of Kashmir, and Love in the Time of Quarantine, and a book of short stories, A Fistful of Earth and Other Stories, long listed for the Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award, 2015. He, all, he has also co-edited two anthologies, namely, a Long Dream of Home, The Persecution, Exodus and Exile of Kashmiri Pandits, and Once We Had Everything, Literature in Exile. In 2021, he won the New Asian Short Story Prize for his short story, Elephant's Tusk. His short stories have been long listed for Laurian Hemingway Short Story Prize, Royal Society of Literature's B.S. Pritchard Short Story Prize, and Sean, Fall Sean O'Fallon Short Story Prize. Siddharth's short films, The Last Day and Goodbye Mayfly, have won several awards at international film festivals. His writings appear in various literary journals. Our third and final speaker for today is Professor Pranjal Bora. Professor Pranjal Bora, a well-known film critic and a creative writer, is an associate professor in the Department of English, Dikhomu College, Sivasagar. He is also serving as guest faculty teaching film studies at the PG class in Center for Journalism and Mass Communication, the Brugger University. Guest faculty, North Lakhimpur College, Autonomous, Department of Assamese, and guest faculty, JB College, Autonomous, Department of Film Studies. He has been awarded the prestigious Prague, Prague Scene Award for Best Film Critic 2017 and the Best Film Critic State Award for 2017 and 18. He has also published a collection of articles on films titled Pukhi Manuhor Chalachitra Aru Ananya. I shall now invite Professor Ira Bhaskar to present her views on today's topic. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Tishya, and, uh, and also to TMYS. It's a great pleasure to be here and to be here among friends, both of whom I know. And of course, you have selected a very, very important topic. Uh, for discussion, which is very relevant for uh, not just India and uh, other parts of South Asia, but also um, for the world. So since we're focusing on South Asia, I'm my uh, whatever I'm presenting is also going to be um, relevant for us in South Asia, India mainly, and also towards the end, I will speak a little bit about a couple of films, one from Bangladesh and one from Pakistan. And um, I want to begin and of course, you know, it is the partition that is going to be the focus of my uh, my presentation, uh, what I'm going to speak about. And I'd like to begin with a quotation from Hayden White, 
um, who says that holocaustal events cannot simply be forgotten and put out of mind, but neither can they be adequately remembered, which is to say clearly and unambiguously identified as to their meaning and contextualized in the group memory in such a way as to reduce the shadow they cast over the group's capacities to go into its present and envision a future free of their debil debilitating effects. Um, I look at uh, the partition as the invisible Holocaust, as uh, Ashish Nandi has, has uh, spoken of it. And therefore, it is the traumatic political and social cultural histories of South Asia that, um, that is marked by this uh, event that um, I'm going to um, look at. Now, I don't want to go into the background of the, of the partition, how many people died, how many were displaced, but it's important to remember just two or three figures. Uh, the unofficial estimates are 16 million displaced, 1 million killed are official figures, but 2 million is um, the estimate, and um, 1 million uh, women raped and abducted. Now, just to keep this in mind, I want to now um, talk a little bit about the way in which cinema has responded to this, um, to this event. And uh, the representation of partition actually in, in um, Indian cinemas uh, demonstrates the belatedness that is uh, typical of the of trauma experience. And um, uh, there were a few films, not so many, there were a few films from 1947 onwards in uh, Indian cinema, especially in Bombay cinema um, and Bengali cinema. But, the, uh, but actually, um, the, in comparison with literature, the number of films is very, um, are very few. And in the first phase, which is 1947 to 62, with the exception of Rithik Ghatak, uh, obliqueness and indirectness were the modes of uh, representing the existential experiences of the dispossessed and the dislocated. So the losses of the partition, what did it mean? And the, the kind of um, exile, the dislocation, the displacement, and the yearning for the lost homeland. I want to begin with this um, theme. And, and at this point, I want to show a clip from um, uh, Meghira, uh, from sorry, Komal Gandhar, Ritwik Ghatak's 1961 film, Komal Gandhar. So if I could have the uh, clip, I'll just, Play it from here. It's um. <laughs> Can you see it? Uh, right now, the screen is it's not visible. It's not visible. Okay. I don't know what has happened because it was. <coughs> Can you uh, can... I think I'll I'll just stop sharing and maybe share it again. Is that okay? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma can you see it now? Uh, no, ma'am. I don't think you have shared your screen. Okay. It's, it's ah, yes. Yes. Okay. So this is um, Komal Gandhar, 1961. <coughs> I'm 
ਹਨ ਪਿਓ ਚਿੰਦ ਹੋਏਗਾ ਉਹ ਨਾ ਦੇਸਤਾ ਤੇ ਤੇ ਤੂੰ ਤੂੰ ਕੋਹੇਗਾ ਸ਼ੁਕਰੀਆ ਉਹ ਮੇਰੀ ਬਾਹਮਾ ਦੀ ਸਟੇਟ ਕੀ ਹੋਈ ਹਨ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਜਦੋਂ ਬੋਲਦੇ ਆਵੇ ਆਦਰਨ ਰੁੱਖ ਤੋਂ ਆਵੇ ਕੋਈ ਬੰਦੂ ਪਾਵਣਾ ਨਾ ਤੇ ਇਹ ਜਾਣੋ ਅਮ ਸਭ ਸਮੇਂ ਅਮਨ ਛਿਆ ਨਾ ਨਾਮਨ ਇਹ ਦਿਨ ਛਿਲੋ ਇਹ ਦਿਨ ਪਾਰਟਨਰ ਉਹ ਬਾਰੇ ਬੋਸ਼ੇ ਅਲਪਤ ਕੋ ਸਾਤ ਘੰਟਾ ਸ਼ਬਦ ਵਿਸ਼ੇ ਅਸਤੋ ਆਕਾਸ਼ੇ ਮੇ ਕੋ ਮੋਰ ਤੇ ਮੋਰ ਤੇ ਜੰਗ ਬਾਦਲਾ ਤੋ ਕਿ ਤਾ ਪਰ ਮੋਰ ਤੇ ਸਾਤ ਪਸਾਨ ਤੋ ਇਹ ਲਮਾਂ ਦਾ ਬਾਬਾ ਮਾਰ ਕੇ ਲੈ ਕੇ ਕੀ ਦੇਖੋ ਮਾਰੇ ਮਾਰੇ ਐਕਰ ਕੋ ਨਾ ਕੇ ਤੇ ਪੀਸੇ ਸੇ ਕੇ ਲੈ ਜੋ ਕੇ ਸਾਹਮਣੇ ਮੋਰਾ ਠੀਕ ਆਦੀ ਬਾਬਾ ਬੋਲੇ ਸੀ ਜਦੋਂ ਤੱਕ ਆਰੰਭ ਕਰੇ ਸਲਾਮ ਕੀ ਨੀਂ ਨਾਲ ਚੰਦੇ ਇਹ ਭਾਵੇਂ ਸੀ ਲਈ ਜਾਵਾ ਤਾਂ ਕਿਉਂ ਜੀ ਸਿੰਦਰਾਂ ਦੀ ਨਾਲ ਲੋਹੇ ਦੀ ਨਾਲ ਕੀ ਫਿਰ ਸੁਣ ਹੈ ਕਾ ਹੋਏ ਕਿ ਜੀ ਤੂੰ ਜਾਣਾ ਨਾ ਕੀ ਕਰਾਂ ਮੈਂ ਬੜਾ ਇੱਕ right so um one second I'll stop it so it's very um clear the the themes of um, dislocation of exile of um um uh, forced exile and the emotional texture of what that yearning for the homeland means it's a very complex um um sequence and cinematically it's very interesting because it's so layered and so dense it will take me a lot of time to explain that so i won't but i just want to uh, draw your attention to the way in which the camera um moves down on the railway track and crashes into the barrier um that separates um the home of these characters that lies now in a foreign country and and the, the yeah. film and uh, the partition quartet is actually about that experience related to um to to themes of displacement of yearning of nostalgia for the lost homeland um uh, are themes of the uh, the condition of refugeehood of how the refugee um uh, lives and uh, the way in which exile or exodus or migration um uh, the manner in which it constitutes the lives of those who've been forced into exile and i'd like to just mention here meghit akatara and shobhan rekha both films by ritik ghatak meghit akatara 1960 shobhan rekha 1962 um it was released only in 65 but those both these films are actually about refugees um trying to rebuild their lives in a new uh, context and the tragic consequences of migration actually um again uh, they are very important films um and they they um, actually speak about what it means to be um a refugee and how easy or difficult the central characters uh, in both the films have very tragic have a very tragic end demonstrating the difficulty of forgetting uh, the traumatic experience of the holocaust the indian holocaust that is uh, the the themes um of um, the partition and how it affected also um affects um the representation of um the experience at different other at other moments in in the um in film history and i'd like to just point to the indian new wave and some some tropes of the indian new wave so while garam hawa uh, made by ms satyu 1973 is not a film that demonstrates what happens um when its characters migrate it's actually a film that's very interesting because it is about and is clearly a response to the violence now this time of the contemporary so in the 70s there was the bhivandi riots of 71 other uh, hindu muslim riots that had taken place and um uh, this this is a, a film that's based on 
um, two short stories. <laughs> And uh, I mean, it's um, uh, written for the film, drawing on two short stories about the partition. And so um, Satyu uh, actually um, is responding to, so he goes back to the moment of the partition, but he's responding to the contemporary. And uh, the narrative is actually about Muslims being pressured to migrate. They want the, the larger community wants Muslims to leave for Pakistan and the way in which there is resistance to this pressure by Salim Mirza and his family, and Salim Mirza particularly. And, and at the end, how he too is forced to, to leave, but then his son, younger son, um, joins the resistance movement against, against the expulsion of Muslims and he joins a movement to fight for the rights of Indian citizens of, of employment, of um, 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 home, of a home, and of food. So um, it's a very, very important film. Difficult to imagine mm. that kind of a film being made today with the kind of, dim, you know, with the kind of vision of the Muslim as an integral part of Indian um, society of uh, and of Indian history. What is very poignant about this film is the way in which the dadi, the figure of the dadi, the old woman, refuses to leave the haveli because for her, um, leaving one or the home that she married into and came is like migrating elsewhere. And she refuses to do that. And she can only die peacefully once she's brought back to this Haveli. It's a very, very uh, poignant kind of a moment. The other theme that I want to also just signal is the theme of the journey, the quest. Uh, the, and, and this journey is the journey, forced journey into exile, which Tamas, Govind Nilani, six-part TV series, Tamas from 87 and 88 is about. And the second half of the series moves into an epic mode of the journey, and it's almost allegorical. So the violence, uh, once again, Nilani is responding to the violence of the, uh, communal violence of the contemporary, and which erupts, seems to erupt repeatedly in contemporary. India. So we have then the return of the traumatic event, the partition, in a way, the constitutive event that leads to the formation of different nations in South Asia, um, that this, this traumatic event, partition, seems to repeat in, uh, sorry, seems to recur in contemporary cinema, uh, responding to the sectarian violence in South Asia. Um, well, there is one story that uh, that has has been represented in different forms, and that is the narrative of the abducted woman's recovery program that both India and Pakistan launched in the in the late forties, in which Muslim women were recovered supposedly and uh, sent back to Pakistan, and Hindu women were recovered for India. And uh, Chalia, nineteen fifty nine, was an early example of that. Um, when uh, Nutan, the figure of Nutan, is brought back to India from Lahore, where she was left behind mistakenly, and how her family refused to um, refused to um, uh, accept her. And uh, the other uh, very poignant story is the story of Shahid, uh, a Punjabi film, Shahid Mohabbat Buta Singh, um, where the uh, with Zainab. The, the uh, woman who the Sikh figure marries, um, she doesn't want to go back to Pakistan, how she's forced, how she's ill-treated, and so on. So this forcible return, um, you know, uh, of the woman back to the so-called home country, which which led to a lot of tragedies, um, Gadar, for all its, um, for all its problems, uh, also deals with a, a version of the story. And of course, there's Pinjar. Now, Pinjar is a very, again, these are films that are made in the contemporary. Um, and so I, my point is that this is an allegorical move, um, going back to the past to actually think about the present. And um, related to Pinjar, so Pinjar is a, a, a similar film. But very interestingly, in Pinjar, the central character, female uh, woman character, um, chooses to stay back in Pakistan, even though it's a Hindu girl who's being recovered for India, but she chooses. And um, a parallel film one could think of um, is Mammo, in which the Muslim Mammo Be um, uh, Mahmuda Begum, or Mammo, chooses to live in India, leave Pakistan and come. Now, these two, uh, these two women characters are actually uh, illustrative, or they, they really tell us about 
how the uh, it is women who can uh, uh, make their home, but also very tragically, uh, they are often failures to do that. And that is represented by, uh, by uh, uh, a film called Khamush Pani, a Pakistani film by Sabiha Sumar called Khamush Pani made in 2003. So with, with Khamush Pani, now Khamush Pani is very interesting in many ways because it is of course um, a film in which Aisha, the central character, um, who was uh, who is um, who was born a Sikh, um, and name was Biro, uh, who Aisha attempts for to make uh, Pakistan her home um, and has gives birth to a son and so on, but the past um, does not let her alone. So the well. Uh, which in which she had escaped from jumping, you know. So the 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 well is a trope in partition literature. It refers to several incidents uh, that happened in different villages during the partition riots, in which um, uh, men um, through their or women did that voluntarily also jumped into wells to escape being being abducted or molested or taken away or killed by Muslim men. And the well, therefore, has this eerie quality. Um, and it seems to be like a destiny. So if you escape it once, it seems like that de that destiny is one that you that women find very difficult to escape from. And that's the tragedy of, um, of Aisha, who finally has to jump into the well 30 years after she had escaped um, the well. So in, in, in many ways, it's a landscape that is haunted by this past, by the past of the um, of violence, by the past of um, uh, forced um, exile, by the past of uh, the failure of attempts to to um, make a home, and uh, um, and just mention very quickly a Bangladeshi film from 1999 called Chitra No Dirpari uh, by Tanvir Mukammal, which is about the um, migration of, uh, the forced migration, just as Salim Mirza's family were being forced to migrate, the Hindu family in this film is being forced to migrate um, um, to India from Bangladesh um, or Pakistan at that point. And, um, and you know, what happens and the losses that they incur. So it is as if the partition is not only a constitutive kind of event, it is as if the spectral presence of that, uh, of, um, that event, of that invisible <coughs> Holocaust has, has permeated the, um, the geography, the emotional geography, the psychological geography, and the physical geography of all of South Asia. And I'd like to just end, because I think I've taken quite a lot of time, I'd like to end by mentioning Anup Singh's Kissa, which is really about that spectrality, the spectral presence of the partition and what it does and the human efforts at, um, at adjusting to migration, which seems so futile, which seems self-defeating. So I'll stop here. I'd like to show a clip from Kissa at the end, if there is time. OK? Is that OK? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am, for this wonderful presentation. <clears throat> I would now like to ask Mr. Siddharth Tigo to present his views on today's topic. Over to you, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, Trisha. Am I, first of all, am I audible? Yes, uh, yes sir. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, so I'll try. Uh, on October 23, 1992, uh, Emre Cortez, uh, the famous uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, author uh, of Jewish descent, he was a Hungarian, he delivered an address at the University of Vienna on what it meant for a generation to bear the burden of the Holocaust. <clears throat> The lecture, which is also a book uh, which has been brought out by Siegel Publishers uh, entitled The Holocaust is Culture, is a, is a very important and seminal text on the Holocaust suffered by the uh, European Jews. Towards the end of the lecture, Curtis asks a very important and ethical question. He asks, can the Holocaust give rise to values? For Curtis, uh, 
deportation from his home in Budapest and serving time in a Nazi extermination camp in Germany at the age of 14 led to a deeper understanding of his own condition, intellectual as well as spiritual. This uh, crisis which, about which we read in his books uh, led to, a, to some sort of an awakening of knowledge within him about the human spirit and the, uh, the will to be free in times of horror. Around the same time in 1992, when Curtis delivered this lecture, uh, and he was also writing about the role of the Holocaust in molding his own identity as a writer, <clears throat> about the same time, about half a million displaced Kashmiri pundits were battling alienation and deprivation in horrid camps in and around Jammu, in Delhi as well, mostly in Jammu. Two years had passed since their enforced ouster from Kashmir, their homeland for centuries. They had not abandoned hope despite being forced to live uh, impoverished lives in camps that lacked almost all necessary amenities. You know, everyday people perished uh, because of uh, lack of proper food, water, medical care, sanitation, etc. My family and I were among these people. At the time, I remember I was uh, in my late teens. <clears throat> I was 15 when we got displaced, when we were in fact forced out of uh, Kashmir. And my sister was, uh, she was nine years old. Uh, I remember nobody paid heed to what we uh, were made to go through as children in these camps. Uh, most of us lived and studied in tents. Now, imagine living in a camp for 20 years. And 12 years out of those 20 years in tents. And 12 years in one room tenements. Uh, which are nothing but, I mean, how do I put it, um, indescribable. No. Now, those camps, some of those camps still exist in Jammu. Now, imagine this is modern India. The only difference is that they are now kind of pakka buildings wherein uh, people are forced to take shelter. I mean, these people once lived in their own land, uh, in their own ancestral houses. Now, I don't even want to describe or maybe I will not be able to describe a camp to you because I have been trying to paint the picture for years now. I mean, every day I try to go back to those days and see how it was living in a camp. I mean, imagine I can't even imagine living uh, in, a, in a tent for a day now. But I remember thousands lived in those camps for years together. So those of us who survived, uh, were not possibly meant to survive. We were just fortunate. I was among the fortunate, but my grandfather was not. And uh, many other uh, people who were in their 50s and 60s and 70s at the time, I remember, weren't uh, uh, fortunate because they did not survive. You know, they were gripped with strange afflictions. I mean, afflictions which do strange things to human mind and to human uh, souls. So uh, memory became unmemory, space became unspace in those cramped spaces wherein uh, a family of say 10 or 12 people, I mean these are a joint family system those times in you know, late 80s and 90s. So I remember in many camps, in many tents, tent, tent dwellings, if I may call them, many of them tattered, you know, joint families scrounging for space. So, so that's why I, how do I describe that? So space became unspace and time became untime. Uh, years later, when I read uh, Holocaust literature and I read it for a particular reason, 
uh, I remember Primo Levi, you know, when he was describing his own time in Buna, uh, which was a sub camp of Auschwitz, you know, he, he says for us, history had stopped. I can relate to that now because I remember uh, days wherein for us, even time stopped, let alone history. Uh, so especially given the context that that the community I belong to, you know, its history dates back 5000 years, you know, uh, and there is a history of several uh, forced and forced displacements over the centuries. Uh, now, quoting Jean Emery, who is also another Austrian Austrian writer, I admire him very much, who survived internments in Auschwitz and many other camps. Uh, and later he took his own life. Uh, Curtis li likens the survivor to an accident. I mean, he, uh, he calls uh, it an accident and he which which requires justification and he says the survivor in fact is unjustifiable i mean justifying uh, suicides of so many people and he <clears throat> says that uh, that entire community jewish community was not meant to survive those who survived was just an accident i think uh, so the losses we were meant we were made to incur in camps are in unimaginable you know even today, I'm just, I just wonder how must we as a community and as individuals who have memory of, who have gone through that tunnel of darkness, how do we assess and measure these losses uh, from a cultural perspective and from a civilization perspective? So writers like Curtis and uh, Primo Levi and Eli Wiesel and Borowski and many others uh, who they help us understand our own condition, including the possibility of maybe return <clears throat> and the possibility of giving rise to a to a new set of values, uh, maybe of reconciling the past. Because after a time, uh, when you go through years of such turmoil and ordeal, uh, the human nature is such that you 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 try to reconcile, you know, so mm -hmm. reconciling our past from days of glory to days of persecution and banishment, yet preserving this memory to craft our present. So those of who, who those of us who <clears throat> genuinely longed to return to Kashmir, I mean, I'm talking of people uh, who spent, who had spent almost their entire lives uh, in Kashmir and they really wanted to die there. And they got displaced at an age wherein they it's almost impossible to walk from one room to another you know so they're long dead those people you know they died and they perished in camps an entire generation you know i was witness to that to that you know hundreds and thousands of elderly people who were forced out of their homes in their 60s late 60s 70s even 80s they perished and what is left now is just residue and this residue i feel that it still casts a long shadow over our own personal histories so it's been 32 years this year in exile and a long time and it's now that i'm beginning to understand maybe a little bit why the fourth and fifth generation of jews are still writing memoirs and making films even now uh, even today uh, because maybe they are still grappling and coming to terms with, with what history served them i mean the fate history not served them not i mean i'm not talking since the second world war in europe but i mean going back to the days of moses and what happened to them in egypt i think that's how they look at their own uh, history and the impact of this brutal history on them as a people across generations still being understood by them and i find myself at the same in the same situation that how do i understand what happened <clears throat> what happened to uh, my family especially 
in the 90s, those 10 years, which were the darkest of those, I mean, there was nowhere to go. Absolutely. There is absolutely uh, deprivation and there is a question of survival, you know. And uh, so this is evident also in the literature and cinema that uh, that's being produced by those of us who have gone through that. And uh, Professor Ira Baskar uh, eloquently uh, summarized 50 years of, uh, uh, of, of history, uh, more than that, 70 years of history and, uh, and uh, through these uh, films. Um, so, so all this, I mean, our own writings, uh, whether it's an article, whether it's a poem, whether it's an essay or a novel or a short story, this is nothing but, you know, commemoration of people people who are real people, people who we have known. Some of those people are us ourselves, you know, mm -hmm. and events mm -hmm. and memories and losses, you know. Uh, Jews, look at Jews, for instance, have hundreds of museums ac across the world. I got to know very late in life that, and they, <clears throat> that's where they have preserved uh, their entire history in these buildings, you know, and there are cinema, there is documentation around that. Uh, and the real question now I asked after 32 years of, you know, uh, being deprived of my own homeland, and that is the homeland of my ancestors. I asked the question, who am I? Uh, what happened to us? What will become of us years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 100 years from now, children of our children who will have inherited borrowed memories? How should we live? How should we understand the past and its impact on us? You know, because it makes us realize and maybe uh, makes us know our own capacity for suffering. Because this is what happens uh, when we get displaced, especially enforced and because of violence, political violence, ethnic violence, it would happen in Kashmir. And uh, uh, Kashmir is still uh, too dangerous for us to go. Uh, I recently watch that movie the last days which is uh, directed by spielberg which is about those four uh, uh, european jews there is a beautiful uh, book i read recently called the fifth fifth diamond by irene i have that somewhere and she asks the same question you no know, i did not want to see how much hatred still exists in the land of my birth i think that recently this year a few months ago we saw that we saw the violence in Kashmir again, and we saw the violence against the targeted targeted violence against certain minorities. Even <clears throat> even uh, Golgapa Wallas who have who who are earning a livelihood, who have who have, who have, who have made Kashmir their temporary home, uh, they they're, they're from Bihar, and even even uh, so uh, so so understanding this capacity. Uh, for suffering and for pain and our own capacity for the ups and downs of life given the socio-historical and political contexts <clears throat> we find ourselves in. So I must pause here because there is this, uh, as I speak, there is this uh, storm of memories which, you know, flashes before my eyes and I am very much drawn to sharing that. But maybe I will pause here and I will ask uh, uh, Mr. Pranjal to also uh, share his own thoughts about this thank you so much thank you so much sir it was very informative uh, i would now like to ask professor Pan pranjal Bora to share his views on today's topic uh, first uh, iram m uh, iram m is dotted as sort of an authority on ritik khatap uh, a renowned film scholar and see that you all know after having listened to you uh, I feel like a fish out of water, you know. Uh, first of all, both of you have made me, you know, heavy. What should I say? And you two are biggies and I am just a greenhorn, a novice. Uh, but what I am going to do, I am going to, I rather going to make some observations and I'll focus mostly on, you know, my own terrain, not Uh I'll start with two clips. Tisha, two clips. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. 
so have you shared your screen yeah okay. i have we can see now but not the sound oh, no yeah, it, it doesn't okay. contain much of a sound you will have a little bit of ambient sound only okay tell us the name of the film pranjal uh it's handook the hidden corner okay which language That's is part it? of what i'm going to tell you okay The next clip, it's from the Lady of the Lake, a Monipuri film. Thank you. Two small clips. Uh, the first is from a Moran language film called Handu, uh, in English, Hidden Corner. Uh, it was a film uh, which uh, went on to grab a number of international awards a couple of years back, uh, including uh, the award for the best film at Mami. Um, and also it was screened at Busan and many other prestigious film festivals. Uh, it was. It is a film about you know a woman named Putoli. Putoli is a widower, and she happens to inhabit a very remote village in Upper Assam. Uh, uh, she had a son who left home to join an underground outfit, and then he went missing. Uh, rumors were agog that uh, he was killed by the you know security forces. Now Putli is living alone. Uh, Mayor living is a formidable salience for her. She has to go through fire and water just to sustain herself. Uh, in the 80s, uh, when you know Assam was uh, burning with all sorts of you know political turmoil and things like that, uh, those places never saw any kind of progress. Uh, and even today, uh, it is a place, it is a terrain where there is no trace of any kind of progress or development. Time stands still out there. For somebody like Putoli, you know, uh, the, 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 the notions of border, violence, migration, forced migration make little sense. Uh, what makes sense to her is how she carries through. Uh, you know, this is a kind of, you know, issue which is so endemic to this terrain that uh, finding representation of this kind of issues in any kind of mainland, mainland cinema, mainstream cinema or literature is unthinkable. Uh, uh, the second clip was again from one of the most, should I say, talked about, rather should I say internationally canonized uh, films from this, The Lady of the Lake. 
I'm sure Ram M is well aware of that particular film. It's a visually stunning film, and it's uh, such a, I mean, it, it, it grabbed accolades both from critics and connoisseurs alike, and it went on to create ripples on the festival circuits across the globe. Uh, again, it is a film uh, which very sensitively, veraciously addresses certain issues related to existence, related to violence, migration, uh, in a very spiffy way. Again, these issues are very endemic to this terrain. So what happens in this particular film, I'm talking about the Lady of the Lake, um, uh, there are certain fishing communities who have been inhabiting uh, the Lock Talk Lake. Uh, what they do, uh, they build up certain, you know, biomasses called Pamdis. Uh, and they have been, you know, inhabiting those particular biomasses for centuries, for ages, generation after generation. Now so happens that <clears throat> suddenly uh, they are, uh, you know, picked on as the culprits uh, to, 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 to lead to some kind of environmental pollution. And they are, you know, blamed for, should I say, destroying the biodiversity, rich biodiversity of that particular famous lake. So its consequence is that their habitats are bulldozed. They are forced to get away from those that particular place. They are forced to flee away. Now, the question which come to the forefront are all the more important. Uh, now, these people have been, you know, inhabiting that particular space for centuries. Uh, this lake is not just a source of livelihood for them. They worship it. It is some sort of a goddess to them. Is it they who are creating pollution? Or is it something else, else which is driving the so-called authorities to take such initiatives? Now, the film remains, you know, open-ended. Uh, and of course, uh, I, I, I use the the, the, the the final sequence of the film, and you all can appreciate uh, how metaphorical it is. Uh, so, uh, I, another film is cropping up before me. Uh, Alifa. Now, Lady of the Lake, just as Lady of the Lake is a very well known film. Alifa is again a very well known film. Uh, in if my memory is still in good name, in 2016, uh, that film, Alifa, grabbed the national award for first debut film of a director. Uh, in Alifa, also, uh, we come across two siblings uh, uh, forced to come to Guwahati from a remote Borpeta village, uh, thanks to floods and other livelihood issues. And when they come to Guwahati and try to fend for themselves, they have to face a lot of difficulties. You know, again, they have to go through foreign waters and more so because they happen to come from a minority community. So why am I, you know, citing such examples? The reason is pretty simple. Uh, well, when it comes to representing, you know, issues like partisan, Kashmir issues, uh, there is no doubt of representation, both in mainstream media and avant-garde media, be it film or literature. But what about these people? What about these terrains for the people of Manipur, for the people of Moran, for the people of Assam, for the people of Northeast? These issues are equally important. I mean, maybe that these issues are very endemic, but they are so existential that we can never deny the importance of, uh, or rather the essence of these issues for uh, these people. My point is, don't you think there is a serious lack of equitability and uniformity in the present representation of the issues related to migration, violence, border, or whatever else in cinema and literature. While 
there are certain issues which assume the status of grand narratives. For example, the ones I have just mentioned. But does that mean that you have to you have to you know elevate yourself uh, to the position of a grand narrative to get the kind of due recognition to get to, to get the kind of recognition you deserve. Also, uh, I feel in cinema and literature, while these issues are uh, adequately represented, uh, certain issues having the same importance, having the same connotations, you know, happening else elsewhere, are not getting the right kind of recognition and representation. And this is an area we need to address too. Uh, second observation. Well, official history seems to be prone to, you know, depicting the heroics of male folks. Whatever the issue is, be it partition, be it customer issues. And I, I appreciate the, I appreciate why official history is forced to do that because it has to go by the book. Uh, but paradoxically, it is literature and cinema where we find a totally different outlet, different story. Uh, literature and cinema, uh, you know, epitomize many instances of uh, the importance of women in the context of such crisis. Or rather, we, we know, at least the socio-psychological history bears testimony to the fact that when it comes to crisis like this, uh, you know, uh, it is always the women folk who suffer the most. Uh, from that perspective, it is heartening to discover again and again that in Indian cinema and literature, at least, both mainstream and avagat, we find adequate representation of women uh, in, in, in this, uh, you know, turbulent times. Uh, 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 some some examples are cropping up before me. Uh, again, examples from Northeast. Uh, there is one novel by Haith Academy Award winner, uh, Rita Sothori, Makam. Makam is a novel which depicts the struggles, the hopes and aspirations of Chinese Assamese community. Uh, uh, there was a time when uh, they, they had a huge pollution. No sign, sign is war. Uh, they were forced to migrate uh, to China. Uh, and there is another uh, by Orun Horma, another well known writer from Assam, uh, Akhir Badar Rong, uh, The Color of Blessings. Uh, in that particular novel, also, I mean, we, we come across a particular characters or rather the protagonist who also you know real under a lot of uncertainty because of their uh, subaltern backgrounds they they are forced to migrate uh, to places which they don't belong to which they don't feel like uh, belonging to uh, and and you know i mean see not to speak of others even most of the esteemed panelists today you people are not even aware of this particular pieces of literature. Uh, I mean, these endemic issues. Uh, because these issues uh, have not been able to assume the significance of you know, who to blame. Uh, but this is a grim reality we must not ignore. Uh, third point, of course, I don't know it has anything to do with what I have already shared with you. Naive realism is a kind of uh, epoch-making concept uh, which tries to imply that, uh, that our understanding of the world and our experiences with the world is a deficient one. And uh, to cut it short, probably naive realism is the basis of most of the cognitive biases and heuristics. And it is these cognitive biases and heuristics which somehow, you know, in a way, cogs us into interpreting everything that comes our way. Uh, so naive realism is a kind of concept which helps us understand how our external memory and internal memory work, how priming effect 
works. And most importantly, it reveals to us how things can be, you know, manipulated sub subliminally. Uh, you know, why again I am referring to these staffs which apparently do not have uh, anything to do with what we are discussing today. It is simply because we are trying to interpret things. We are not trying to represent. So when it comes to, you know, interpreting things, when it comes to, you know, tons of our cognitive biases, heuristics are bound to creep in. So even when we try to, you know, interpret uh, partisan Kashmir issues, or even the issues, uh, the ones that I have discussed, I have revealed to you. Now, we should be aware of naive realism. We should be aware of all sorts of cognitive biases and heuristics. And otherwise, we'll miss out on the essence. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for this very enlightening presentation. So with this, we shall now move forward to the question answer segment. Uh, my first question is to Professor Ira Vaskar. How does the representation of forced migration and refugees in films play a role in establishing or altering national narratives? Over to you, ma'am. Okay. okay, thanks. Thanks, Desha. Actually, you know, um, whether it is cinema or whether it is literature, the role that the arts can play um, in bringing to the consciousness of people issues that are just, you know, all the issues that we've been talking about today, whether it is uh, the violence associated with um, uh, um, sectarian conflict or whether it is, you know, the eviction of people, forcing them to leave, like Siddharth talked about very movingly, or the issues that Pranjal is talking about, you know, all of these issues. It is the role of literature and cinema to bring this to the consciousness of the people. Um, now, here, form different kinds of forms uh, make an impact on how how much of this material is communicated. You know, I mean, I look at the present reality today, and I think that my God, I mean, you know, uh, the majority majority is hardly interested in any of these issues. There are dominant discourses, political discourses, and they don't care about people's lives. They're uh, whether they live or they die, and this applies not just to one community or the other. Um, I mean, look at the farmer's issue and whatever. So the point is, you know, literature and cinema cannot change national narratives, right? They cannot um, resolve political situations. What they can do is to create more and more discourse, more awareness, so that uh, that more people can become aware that these are crucial issues you know, that we need to think about, that we need to, and and then depending on the, the volume of the discourse, the power of that discourse, bring pressure, you know, as that discourse gains momentum, bring pressure on, on um, uh, political, um, you know, uh, groups and the powers that be to bring about certain changes. So national narratives, um, I mean, I think the arts have a very important role in bringing in the experiences of suffering, the experiences of trauma to the fore. And that is the role that the arts have, whether <clears> literature <throat> or cinema, so that uh, because there are afterlives of films and novels and books, so that one generation, the generation that has in which it is written, that's not the only generation that read. They, there are afterlives of all of this. So other generations will also learn from that and hopefully learn from history. So short answer to your question. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, my second question to you is, when it comes to representation of violence and trauma in films vis-a-vis post-migration, do you think the reality is altered in order to satisfy stereotypical or preconceived ideas? I think that this depends a lot on what kind of form the, you know, the literature, the literary piece or the cinematic piece has. Who is producing it? Who is making it? Is it a mainstream film narrative? In which case, there will be happy endings, resolutions, you know, a mainstream, you know. Um, so, for instance, I'll give you an example of um, of the film Bombay by Mani Ratnam, which was released in 95. And it's about Hindu-Muslim conflict. And it was very successful. It was one of the highest grocers of. And it has a successful and happy resolution at the end. 
because the people of the community come together. And the film was criticized a lot, saying that holding hands and singing songs at the end, there's a song and people, the community comes together holding hands, does not solve the communal problem. And in one sense, yes. But you know, I think she has an internet issue. Um, so maybe she can answer when she, uh, you know, gets back to us. Uh, shall we move forward uh, to Mr. Siddharth Kigo? Okay, sir. Uh, so my first question to you is, could you tell us about the distinction between literature emerging from forced migration and literature that portray forced migration? How do these direct the sociological approaches towards refugees? Over to you, uh, sir. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I'm just having a deja vu kind of a moment, Disha, because uh, you know, nine, from 95, 1995 to 97, I was in JNU. I was studying, uh, I was doing my master's in uh, literature in the School of Languages. And uh, uh, while uh, uh, my parents uh, were in Udhampur, living in a rented accommodation, and and uh, the last, the previous four years were, were, were terrible for us. And I mean, imagine the JNU classroom of 95 or 96, 97, and when uh, this very question, uh, this very aspect was uh, explored, debated uh, at the Ganga Daba, uh, at the Parthasati rocks, in classrooms, in the library, in canteens, the library canteen, these are the very famous pe uh, places. And Professor Bhaskar is again with us, uh, Professor Bhaskar, we lost you. Uh, Sorry and then, about that. Uh, <laughs> that we forgot about you. <laughs> I could away, listen, I could the... hear for a while, and then suddenly it went, and I realized I have to rejoin. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Sudhar, yeah. Sorry about Thank that. Thank you so much. Yeah, not at, not at all. So I was um, uh, just uh, recounting a memory uh, uh, from my days in JNU, which was 95 to 97, when we explored this aspect, you know, when uh, at the, perhaps uh, for the first time, I uh, I got to know a little bit about Manipur in JNU, because I had a very close friend and hostel mate. I had absolutely mm. zero understanding of Manipur. I had actually zero, and I think I still have very little understanding because because nobody we we, we 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 did not know i mean that is the time when there is no social media there is none of these amenities we have how do we even know your own country you know how do we even know ourselves let alone others so uh, and then i got to know about the the the, the conflict in manipur I got to know the languages. I got to know about Nagaland. I got to know Shillong. I got to know about Assam. I had no idea. I thought Manipur, Assam is the same. And it's only a few years ago, I'll tell you, this is a funny thing. If only a few years ago, we had a reunion of the batch of 95, 97. And uh, except me, everybody is almost, almost everybody is teaching in big Ivy League colleges in America because they all uh, did PhD and they're all teaching. And, Except me and one another person, a close friend of mine from Manipur, his name is Chong Rolian, works for the, he, 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 he did civils and he's now uh, 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 an official in the Ministry of Telecom. And we were generally sharing views, we were talking about literature, we were talking about cinema, we were talking about diaspora, we were talking about migrations, we were talking about the Rwanda thing, which happened in the, in the 90s. And, you know, he was listening. He, he, you know what he said? He said, all of you morons still do not understand what is happening in Manipur. And he told us things, none of us, I mean, we had no clue. Absolutely. And he talked about some novelists. Apparently, those novelists are also, those novels are translated into English. It's not that we can say that, look, we can't. And he talked about cinema. How on earth do we even understand uh, 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 Manipur, the Manipuri history, the Manipuri psyche, uh, uh, contemporary mm -hmm. history. 
even <clears throat> I mean, I'm talking of educated people. So what Professor Pranjal said raised a very important question. And so uh, to answer the question which Tisha posed is that, well, I myself was understanding my own condition and I was exploring world literature in JNU, especially uh, European literature or Latin American literature, which was a rage and uh, asking the same questions, which now I'm struggling to even answer. So uh, every time I watch a movie, for instance, this clip, uh, you know, Komal Gandhar and Ritwik Ghatak, I think he is too much. Uh, he is an icon. And uh, I remember each and every frame and I remember relating to, although uh, I don't understand Bangla that much, but I think the image itself becomes language. Even if uh, I don't understand the dialogues, but even if I'm deaf and I just mute the dialogues the image will relate to me what uh, professor ira baskar critiqued and read that image for me but when i watched that movie many years ago in a in a in a, in a uh, retrospective i think it was in siri fort i think that was the time when i think siri fort had these retrospectives now you either go to youtube if you are lucky if they are so i remember that train track you know and mm. I had a very good friend. He was a student of cinema. He said, how do you view that image? Can you understand that metaphor? And I had to struggle, you know, that, that to understand that, you know, the rail tracks and then the barrier. And look at that. You don't need dialogues. So even now, after having watched this movie close to 20 times, I still watch it. And I, there is a sure I experience. And that image has so much physicality in it and it talks to you and it takes you back to, to, to those days wherein you saw these train tracks. You know, mm -hmm. the first time I saw a train in my life was in Jammu because in Kashmir that time there was no train. We had only heard of trains, you know, and read about trains, maybe watched movies those times we had this door version. So first time I saw a train track and I tried to, and that train track signifies that, you know, there are certain things which you can never reconcile. They will never meet, you know, so you will always lead partitioned life. So I think with every movie you watch, every book you read, it still is a learning every day. So Tisha, to answer your question is that uh, it, 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 it's, it's taken Jews 70 years and counting to understand and to kind of maybe find meaning, find a sense. I think the same thing applies to each one of us in our own different ways mm -hmm. to understand. I think years from now when people will still be writing about these things and I hope they will be, they will be readers and audience for such movies. And these movies will not be screened in closed rooms and they will be you know, publicly screened free of cost or these books will be out there uh, for, for common people to understand their own, the, 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 their own history and the history of their own, own countrymen. You know, we know so little of our country. We know so little of our, I feel ashamed because what uh, Professor Prajal said that uh, I feel ashamed that this is, the, this is my country and this is how little I know of, of uh, you know uh, and how, how how difficult it is even to watch these movies how do we even well, i think the only exception is uh, school of arts and aesthetics i, I remember uh, having seen a lot of because that is a place wherein anybody can go anybody and everybody minus the pandemic you know yeah. you go <laughs> as a student you go the, as a student you know it's an open university you, uh, it's free. It's free from this so-called um, uh, Bollywood uh, mafia, which has taken over the theaters in the country. But compare it with Chicago, for instance, or New York. There is so much of independent cinema available uh, in small, small theaters there. But here, absolutely, it's like, you know, we need this freedom from this Bollywood production houses. Why do independent people who spend a lot telling their stories and i'm sure the lady of the lake the filmmakers might have i mean auctioned their whatever property to even make this film uh, and given that filmmaking is such a such an expensive proposition and then they get screened in international festivals their own friends might not have access to that thing 
So I'm just sorry I'm taking a long time, but uh, uh, some it just seems to disappear though. Thank you, Sita. Thank you. Yeah, Tisha is back. Okay, good. Tisha is back. Hello. Yeah, yeah. We can hear you, Tisha. Ah. Hmm. Uh, Okay, okay. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, my second question to you is, according to Lewis Tyson, unhomeliness is an emotional state. Unhomed people don't feel at home even in their own homes because they don't feel at home in any culture and therefore don't feel at home in themselves. In this context, could you throw some light on the unhomeliness of forced migrants with regard to Indian English literature? I... I, I think uh, so far as uh, Indian uh, writing in, in English is concerned, I am not very familiar with uh, writings in other languages about about this very important topic, but I think very less has been written about it. I mean, uh, how many novels do we see about partition? I think you can count on hands. Yeah, uh, how many novels? Uh, uh, of course, there are a lot of articles and research papers, but uh, there are people who are still in places like Delhi, for instance, you know, whose whose parents have memory of partition, you know, but they don't talk about it. There's uh, there's nobody to uh, uh, to listen to them. I uh, know a few people who still have horrendous memories about. In camps, I mean, they 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 they, they were forced to migrate from uh, various places in Pakistan, and they are now in Delhi. Some of them, uh, I have been in touch with. Yeah, you ask them to go back to that time, they will narrate stories which nobody knows. We only know things what we have read, and a, a cinema, but there are individual accounts, and there are stories, uh, which is which are beyond, say, for instance, uh, uh, Tamas, you know, beyond. I mean, there are so many Tamases out there in these people's hearts. Uh, I happen to meet uh, uh, a person who is uh, a father of one of my colleagues, and he narrated certain things. Uh, why, what happened to I mean, there are also stories of humanity which is very difficult for us to even stories of deep, deep, deep hum, humanity and humanism uh, makes you cry. But uh, those are fading stories. Uh, nobody has written them. Nobody has documented them. And I think the future generations will be at a big loss, especially researchers, even common people. Uh, they would have they would have loved to hear the stories of uh, humanity. Especially these are people who are their ancestors, you know, 100 years from now, these are people who will they call we descended from, we descend, we are all children of partition. I mean, I mean, uh, Delhi is one big place wherein you have communities wherein these people, I mean, look at uh, Pardganj, half a Pardganj, you know, Punjabi, they're all uh, children of partition. But look at the conversations now. They're not, nobody's interested, but look at a conversation uh, 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 a typical Jewish family, they might, no matter how rich, even New York, you know, they control half of Hollywood. Their dinner table conversations mostly are this. There's so much of social media handles they have, and they still keep on posting photographs. I mean, they have, I mean, very little photographic, I mean, very little photographs of my own camp because we had no cameras that time. There was no nothing. I still regret that. We had one camera, but nobody knew that these photographs would be of immense uh, significance. You know, uh, there is uh, absolute uh, uh, and whatever photographs we had or whatever things we had got destroyed in camps because in camps there was no room for people, let alone uh, uh, for essential uh, human survival. You know. Uh, <clears throat> I remember writing, uh, keeping a diary, keeping a journal those days. But I, 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 I knew that someday I would be, I would be writing about these. So I kept a journal, you know, and uh, uh, which I did. Uh, uh, but uh, I think we, uh, uh, the current generation, I think, is after something else. 
there is only a handful of people which i understand maybe i'm wrong but <coughs> handful of people who who because they are researchers because they are researchers they are after this they are after these stories but largely in engineering colleges in corporate houses nobody cares i mean the, in the in the industry nobody gives a damn which is such a sad thing because in india is a land of storytellers i mean if we don't uh, uh, in a, in a, in a, in a in a kind of a corporate environment people don't share we don't get to, we don't even know i mean uh, people who belong to the northeast if there's a colleague people have difficulty pronouncing their names and they are given these short names do you know they are are these names such a difficult thing to pronounce you know so meetings begin without any human touch we just don't get to know each other i think there are experiences i've had that after 5 years you uh, you kind of digress into a topic and you then have to apologize you say we we be we have known each other for 5 years but this is the first time i am talking to you like this and i'm getting to know this part of you we don't do that you know and nobody reads unfortunately we only are on social media we are absolutely uh, maybe these are my this my biases will be apparent because i just i'm just basing my argument if um, in my own sphere if i know 100 people out of those 100 people how many people do i connect and especially get do such conversations uh, thank you so much tisha thank you sir um so now i would like to request uh, professor ilya bhaskar to continue her answer i think uh, thank you tisha i think uh, you know uh, listening to um, siddharth um actually makes me feel that the uh, answer the question you've asked me is connected to what he's saying and the fact that how is reality altered you know um uh, through representations and i think reality internal realities are, are, are altered not lives some lives are touched by these and and i think storytellers like siddharth and others i want to narrate here very quickly an experience i teach a class called historical trauma memory and cinema okay sometimes in some semesters i teach it and every time i've taught it there are people who in that class students in that class who come up to me late who write papers etc and then they come up to me and they say that i want to study this further because whatever you know i i was very moved by this when i was very moved by that whatever and then i fig- learn from what the papers they write that they are actually children of families that have been displaced either because of partition kashmiris um people from the northeast you know different because they are in class and because they are in class and i'm i'm sharing this material with them making them study this material showing them films that are related their lives have changed so those children whose and siddharth is right because one of the signs of trauma is silence the affected parties will not talk about it for long there's a belatedness there's a lack of lag of time time lag before they and of course i see from siddharth because i'm seeing him after many years and i'm listening to him talk and i see that he has been through an internal transformation himself as well uh, which i can see because of the way in which these experiences have grown inside him and the stories that he's been telling and these lives i've seen them change but will national reality change i doubt it very much because national realities are driven by politics and right now what we are witnessing is horrifying and siddharth i in this class that i teach of course the holoc jewish holocaust is a very major part of it right one year when i taught it and i want to say this to you here and i want to read out a little quote because it has to do with the question also one student asked me a muslim boy in the class asked me that you're showing us all of this what about palestine and that really hit me very hard because palestine was not in my course so i said you're absolutely right i went back and i started watching the palestinian films and the kind of violence that the same jewish 
you know, the Israelis, uh, uh, the kind of violence that from 1948 to today, which is more than 70 years, you know, uh, they are continuing to. So then I realize, Siddharth, that the victim becomes the oppressor. And this is a very curious a very curious, a horrifying, and a very tragic aspect of trauma, that those who suffer. So in one sense, you're right that the Jews, you know, keep up the narrative. They also keep up the narrative because they want to be in control of it. But that narrative also feed, feeds the violence that they then, um, you know, we are seeing some of it in India happening. And I want to just read out, if you'll just... Bear with me, one minute. This is a quotation from Susan Sontag. And it's a very moving few lines. She says, remembering is an ethical act, has ethical value in and of itself. <coughs> we all agree on that, right? <coughs> because half the problems other people as Siddharth is saying, don't want to remember. Memory is achingly the <coughs> only relation we can have with the dead. It's achingly the only relation we have with the dead. But if we keep on signals about the value of remembering in the much longer span of a collective history. There is simply too much injustice in the world and too much remembering and bitters. To make peace is to forget. To remember, it is necessary that memory be faulty and limited, says Susan Sontang in a book on pain. You know, And Ashish Nandi, in another um, context, has said that we need to practice principled forgetting. Because what is important for the future, of course, we must remember. We must remember the trauma. We must remember the suffering. But we must narrate it in order to mourn it and let it go. The process that Siddharth is talking about is a process of mourning. And it's really important to mourn the past and to mourn the, the violence of the past, the, the um, atrocities committed <coughs> in the name of some ideology or the other. And there is also politics of memory. So we have to individually also decide for ourselves, what is our project going to be? Is it to remember such that we uh, we then oppress others? Or is it to remember to understand that we should never repeat this again? Remember history so that we don't repeat it again. That our children don't have to face it. Others don't have to face it. So how, do, how does... Um, uh, reality get altered. Reality will only get altered if we understand that pain and and also commit to, to uh, for it to not be repeated. And in order to do that, it's really important to tell the stories, but also to connect with the <coughs> present. And I think that's really important. And for me, I learned from that student of mine who asked that question, which <coughs> led me on a journey to look at Palestine and Palestinian the Palestinian example. And they are equally violent. The Palestinians are also responding to violence with violence, right? So where is the end of an eye for an eye? Makes everyone blind, said Gandhi. So we also need to think quite carefully about this, about how do we alter uh, reality. I mean, recently, the prime minister of our country has called for us to remember the horrors of partition. Now we need to ask ourselves why, yes, we should remember the horrors. But to what end should we remember the horrors? To take revenge? For one community to take revenge on other communities? It's a very important question. And I think this is where politics, I mean, I'm you know, kind of depressed right now. Um, almost don't feel like teaching the class on trauma anymore because <clears throat> of the reality uh, around us. Though, of course, this is my area of um, research and, and <clears throat> commitment. <laughs> investment and that's why i'm very very moved by the um uh, by the accounts that um siddharth and pranjal have both given here and uh, nobody siddharth can actually un fully understand what you have your you and your families and your community um has gone through in those camps and but looking at other i you know i have just completed working with a student who's worked on Palestinian cinema. And she has a whole chapter on refugee camps, Palestinian refugee camps, camps for Palestinians in Lebanon, Jordan, and in the West Bank. And uh, the films you know, that I have suggested to her that she has looked at. Because I started a journey with that question that the student posed um, in my class. And 
it's important to widen one's experience because that's the only way that reality will change, you know, will alter. And so whether it is Kashmir uh, and Kashmiri Pandits or whether it is Manipuris, um, <clears throat> the Manipuri reality or the reality in the Northeast, not just Manipur, also Nagaland, also in Assam, you know, I have, uh, I have close friends, very close family friend who lost a son to the, um, and, uh, you know, a diagnostic young man who was lost in, to the violence there. So uh, there is too much suffering and injustice in the world. And that is what we need to keep um, before us as we uh, think about and reflect on our own sufferings. That's what I would say, yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, so now we'll move on to Professor Pranjal. My first question to you is, sir, in what ways does featuring a figure of an illegal migrant in films direct the representation or notion of borders on a physical as well as psychological level? Uh, well, Trisha, uh, the thing is, uh, see, uh, let, me be, let me be a little bit, uh, you know, oblique in my approach. Uh, neurocinematics happens to be a new branch of studies, uh, which studies uh, the impact of cinema on human mind and vice versa. Uh, obviously, whatever we see in films, even in a blatant mainstream movie, has something to do with, uh, you know, sort of perception management in the sense that uh, this is why actually, you know, films have always been a very potent medium for propaganda. And these days, uh, things are increasingly becoming more and more difficult and tricky because the, these days, uh, this propaganda stuff, stuff is done subliminally. Uh, so obviously, when we watch a particular film or when we, watch a, uh, uh, when we discover an illegal mi migrant um, in a film, or rather, should I say, that film, you know, builds up a perspective uh, which provokes us to see that particular character as illegal migrant. Obviously, it has sort of a bearing on the way we look at the notions of border and other stuffs. <clears throat> but to what extent, how powerfully, is again a very tricky and, you know, relative kind of a stuff uh, because it is very difficult to predict how our individual memory and our collective memory operate. Uh, it depends on the kind of tools they use. It depends on the kind of, you know, uh, you know, should I say uh, the tool, should I say cinematic, you know, gimmicks they use. Uh, if they do that successfully, uh, we get bored by that. And Again, when we get influenced by that in, in forming certain kind of opinions about border and other issues on the basis of what we see in a film, uh, how long it will linger is another issue. Sometimes it gets deep rooted, it get, gets entrenched in our memory, but sometimes it simply evaporates. It depends on, again, a kind of, you know, matrix, uh, which is beyond our control. And this is why, as part of my introductory, you know, uh, lecture, I refer to things like naive realism, cognitive biases, heuristics, and the way our internal and external memory operate, and the notion of the subliminal. And of course, and you know, we 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 can never get at a very concrete and you know, well ubiquitous kind of you know. Uh, concept unless we bring under scrutiny all these particular factors but yes if you if i have to say in in, in a single statement if i have to encapsulate uh, in a single statement i would say that it is possible that the, the portrayal of a particular immigrant illegal migrant in a film might have significant bearing on the way we look at these issues thank you sir uh, my second question to you is, could you shed some light on the extent to which Indian literature and films have portrayed the post-migration experiences of women with special reference to the partition of India in 1947? Uh, well, Iram M. 
has already referred to death in a very eloquent way and so should i poke my nose into that again but anyway <clears throat> let me refer to some some other uh, some significant you know uh, you know pieces of literature uh, i don't know my memory is in good nick or not but one novel which is popping up is atia hussein's 1961 novel the sunlight on a broken column partition is not an overton there it is an undertone mm. and this novel is a very significant study significant critique on the kind of psychological impact partition has on women uh, the novel remains open ended and there is another anitta by medula gor <clears throat> in that novel also you encounter the same situation mm. and coming back to my own territory uh, there is uh, one novel by um, who is yes onuradha sharma pujari this year's hyto academy award winner in assamis uh, she has a novel i am afraid i have uh, uh, i have forgotten the name uh, she tries to address she tries to probe into this issue uh, in 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 a slightly different way uh now certain other you know of course omrita pitam spinjor um, parvis a quintessential character um, laila of course in the sunlight on, on the broken column uh, yes am i afraid nothing more than that nothing is occurring to me but here if if you kindly if you kindly allow me to allow me to play a one minute clip yes sir yes sir yes is the audio going through uh no sir it's not audible but we can see okay i wanted to anyway there seems to be some technical snake let's avoid this uh i wanted to play this clip to 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 end on a note of optimism at the end of the day we need to understand one thing that empathy is the name of the game yes sir thank you so much sir uh, so now we are in the concluding part of today's session i would like to request professor ira bhaskar to show us her second clip <coughs> is there a need that stashi i think uh, we uh, he is pranjal has ended on a note of optimism with uh, pinjar uh, so i think we can let it be now no there's no need i think the point has been made i what i want to say is that you know i think tmys that's that's the right i think is yes, can perform yes, a very important role for uh, the stories that siddharth was mentioning that there are so many stories that need to be told right i think you can you you and your organization can perform a very important role for allowing give providing a channel through which these stories by younger people you know there's a very important there's a very important term um called uh, that has been used critically 
for um, the the way in which generations that follow, you know, both of them have talked about it, and uh, I didn't have enough time to mention that. But generations that follow um, after the generation that has suffered trauma, displacement, exile, etc. Right? Siddharth is very clearly. Yeah, I think we lost her again. Um, should we wait for some time then, like a minute? Yeah, let's do that, Tisha. Just, yeah, let's just wait because last time she came back within like 30 seconds or so. Yeah, might be an internet issue or maybe. Yeah, power it seems cut to be or... an internet issue. Yeah. Um, so if you want to show the clip again, um, that would be nice. Yes, I just stop it, please. Now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> तो अपने लोगों के बीच चली जा जा रशि तू ही मेरे साथ मेरे लिए यही मेरे घर है रशि Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, so I would uh, like Professor Ira Bhaskar to continue. Yeah, um, you know, the, the, I mentioned Pinjar. Everything was fine. Um, I mentioned. Oh dear. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, so I was saying yes, that. Yes, um, I was saying that um, you know TMYS actually performed this role to channel the stories that. Uh, that uh, young people, you know, um, will write because what happens with other gener generations that have followed, they they may not have gone through that experience, but through uh, their families, you know, through objects, articles, photographs, maybe journal entries, you know, there is a term called post memory. So there are uh, post memory is formed by objects, by artifacts, right? And any narratives, so very often younger people or generations that follow who have not experienced it directly, not experienced, um, you know, the violence and of exile or the violence of, uh, you know, being forced out um, and living the kind of lives that, um, you know, Siddharth's family and Siddharth has himself. But, you know, his children, uh, Siddharth's children may gather a few um, quite a lot of it, uh, a lot of information, just by being in the family. And they'll have narratives, they'll have stories to tell. So those generations, they have stories, a lot of stories. And the more creative work is brought up, uh, brought out, or more creative work is done, and there are organizations like yours to channel this, I think there will be greater sensitivity and empathy and compassion that we can hope to generate among young people um, and counter the kind of atmosphere of social that social media and corporate culture, et cetera, uh, you know, bring about. So I think it's very important for the arts of all kinds. And again, we lost her. Okay, so uh, I would uh, 
once again like to say that we are calling for submissions of stories poems and essays and for project architecture and submission guidelines you can visit our website okay ma'am is back there is some technical snake maybe a big problem here yeah. <coughs> so i applaud you on on your efforts and i think on that note we can you know rather than a depressing note which is what my clip would have <laughs> brought about on this note and to look at the future and look at the future of of storytelling and of sharing experiences that's very important thank you very much thank you thank you so much ma'am uh, so with this we now come to the end of today's session thank you so much for joining thank you. as i was saying, as i was saying that uh, we are calling for submissions of stories poems and essays and for project architecture and submission guidelines please visit our website i extend a heartfelt thank you to professor ira bhaskar professor pranjal bora and mr siddharth nigor for a truly remarkable session it was wonderful to have you with us thank you so much for joining Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.